Thanks, everyone. Um, happy solstice. Let's start the meeting at 6.32. Um, first order of business is public comment. Um, any public comment? Looks like not in the room. Uh, any public comment on the phone? Okay, great. Um, consent agenda. Uh, do you have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move to approve the consent agenda with the exception of the authorization to enter into contract with Engineering Ventures. I just have a couple questions. Okay, so you want to pull that? Yep. All right, uh, do you have a second? Second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. Um, do you want to talk about the contract with Engineering Ventures? Yes. Andrew LaRosa, I just have a couple questions for you. This one here. That's right. It's at the beginning of the meeting, though, this time. That's right. Um, I'm curious who else you considered for the job. We were, we were originally, uh, they came to us on, they've worked with us on several projects. They worked mm -hmm. with us with the um, uh, elementary school project, as well as they're starting to work with us on the middle school project. And when we originally started um, thinking about doing that 4,000, 40,000 square, 40,000 foot study, we partnered with uh, Gossens Bachman and Engineering Ventures. So they had sort of a running start at this. So they've had experience building tracks. They built the one up at UVM. And so it just seemed to be unnatural. So it being a professional service, we were comfortable with them. Thought it was, and their and their fees seemed very much in line with what I would have expected, so we went with them. Okay, so it, suggested it, going with them. It's the only it's the only one you considered. Yeah, is what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, you answered my other question. Why not consider anyone else? But you, like I say, we have got a long relationship with them, and and they've got the experience. So, do you know of others out there that could do the job? Uh, certainly, certainly. Yeah. Certainly. Okay. All right. Excellent. Um, do we have a motion to approve the authorization to enter into contract with Engineering Ventures or further questions on that for Andrew? Or otherwise? Yep. Um, actually, I have a question. It's Lynn. Yeah. Oh, hi, Lynn. Um, is it normal to, I mean, are we under any obligation to put the bid out? Not for professional services. It's like a, retaining an architect or a lawyer. If you can, if you find one that you're comfortable with, and, and Libby, if I'm misstating this, um, but as professional services, you don't need to go out to bid. If it was for construction services, that we absolutely will go out to bid on. Okay. Thanks. Yep. I move that we authorize uh, the district to enter into a contract with Engineering Ventures. I have a second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Great. Thanks. Um, and now on to Jody. Hey, great. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Thanks for having me. Did you get it, Libby, or do you need me? Yeah. Okay. Anna, can you let me share my screen? Oh, great. Start chatting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for having me. And um, I'm hopeful that you all received a postcard in the mail. My household got five, so hopefully you didn't get that many. I'm not sure why that happened, but um, we're trying to get some information out. And it's really important for all of the, the voters across the 18 towns that we serve um, as a career center to get the information about our budget and to, to know where to find stuff and navigate to. So hopefully you got that. Um, soon you'll see the presentation that has current students in it from this year, a few photos. Not quite as many as the like, governance one, um, just because we have so many pieces of information that we couldn't stand against the, the photos and still see the photos. So unfortunate, but hopefully um, you can access you can access our website at any time. You can see some of the newsletters we're sending out and see all the great stuff that's going on. Today, for example, it was today was our Friday, so I'm in my Friday gear. 
um, and we had the culinary class had a burger challenge and Rich McSheffrey from Cornerstone came in and helped judge that and the winning burger is going to be featured next week on the Wednesday night burger night so if you don't have another board meeting that night that would be a great time to go get your five dollar burger or maybe check out that culinary students yes okay. yep yeah and Wednesday's always $5 burger night. They don't pay me, but maybe they will if I keep advertising <laughs> for them. <laughs> um, so the presentation that I have for today is around budget. Um, and Jill's going to chime in if there's anything I miss. It's wonderful having Jill as a member of our board. I'll just stay with you until I'm just checking to see if I can share it. When I can share it, then oh, we'll put that's it up. fine. But I wanted to have it so you had something to look at. And you may or may not know that Jill is our chair. So she's been doing a wonderful job with that, and I really appreciate working with her. So I know you are all lucky to work with her as well. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Um, we're going to probably breeze through the first slides when we do get the opportunity to slide it, um, show you the presentation. And the very first one, um, the board asked me to have the mission statement and vision for the Career Center there. And we realized we don't really have one. There was some work done on it in uh, 2018, 2019, and then it sort of fell apart. And tons of different things have obviously happened in that time. And so what we do have that we usually have in our annual report is a little bit about what we do and the purpose of the Career Center is providing students with the skills they need to be college and career ready. So that's one of the things our board's going to be working on as we move forward in this year. I promise I have a text into the host. No worries. So keep going. <laughs> Uh, so there were lots of things that we think about in our budget. As you know, we have um, 12 programs. And so they range from the culinary that I was talking about to automotive, um, to building trades, to emergency services. This year we have two new programs. We have design and fabrication, which is actually taking place at the Vermont Granite Museum. And those students are learning sculpture, and they're going to be um, cutting stone in the very near future. And they're also working with Vermont Technical College and learning a little bit about CNC and, and computer-aided drafting and some design there. So it's a really exciting new program. It's meant to be a two-year program. Uh, we only got two students in it this year, which was great for our first-year teacher to work to build the curriculum with two students. And we're going to reboot it next year, so we're going to do a second first year to try to get more students in and to take those two students that are in it and work towards putting them in an apprenticeship for next year. So that's really exciting. The other program we have also has two students. It's Advanced Emergency Services, and those students are taking the paramedic courses with VTC. So they're doing 12 credit semesters. Um, both of them passed their first semester. We're very excited about that. And they'll be doing the next semester with VTC as well. So they come in three days a week at our center, work with our instructor, and then they go to VTC in Williston on Thursdays and work through with the entire class, um, the VTC class. And my instructor goes up there after program because he's teaching both the emergency services level one and level two. And um, then they have Friday off if they want it, or a lot of times they're coming in and doing the work because it's a lot heavier than what they had the previous year, having all those college credits. So when they're done with our course, they will just be starting their summer, which is the last component for the VTC program, and they'll be able to test out with a paramedic license at the end of the summer. So it's really exciting to have those two programs. And those are like 17 and 18 year old. Correct. Wow. Yeah, yep. Yeah. In our medical professions this year, we were able to add phlebotomy, so our students <coughs> are coming out with a CCMA license and a phlebotomist license at the end of that, that certification. So if any of you want to um, help us out, they need to do live draws, <laughs> 30 of them. <laughs> so if anyone wants to come in and, and have a student practice the live draw on you, um, we are starting those next month. And I can, I can share with Libby the sign-up sheet. And we can get some of you in. That would be great. <laughs> so there's just lots of exciting things happening. And so those things that we're adding on and trying to build our programs, make them more rigorous, get kids a little closer to an associate's degree before they leave us, um, or that industry certification that they get, for instance, our plumbing program this year, we lost our um, instructor early in the year, uh, resigned. And we were, I taught it not very well for about three weeks until we were able to find um, a company that worked with us. So Vermont Heating and Ventilation has partnered with us. And they've sent the master plumber to work with us two days a week. He's in with the students. And then the, he collaborates with our um, permanent sub, who now is an, has an emergency license. 
and they are collaborating to teach that and starting January 23rd, he'll be in there three days a week working with that instructor and with our kids and we think they're still gonna be ready for that apprenticeship level one exam and it's a really exciting partnership and, and I can see that moving forward too, which opens some other avenues for future uh, programs. So now we have the presentation available for you to look at as well. So when we're thinking about budget, we're thinking about the resources that we need. As you know, our resources are sometimes very different from what you might need here at Montpelier High School, for example, and Jason knows this well, of course. Um, so our building trades, the, the stuff that they're building with costs more money, what our electrical class is using costs more money, all of everything. So any of us going to the grocery store costs more money. So all of those things have gone up. We're looking at how we get qualified staff. We're looking at improving access for our students. We are taking two more classrooms next year for a couple of reasons. One, to expand that medical professions class from 10 to 12. And um, to also allow us to provide a full day opportunity with academics should we be able to move forward with that. Um, and, and in the meantime, we're looking at what other potential facilities could we use. We've done some research and we know that if we could open a welding program, we would be able to fill it really quickly. And we need the space to do that that doesn't exist in our current facility. So looking at opportunities for other facilities and programming is ahead of us and things that we need to think about. You can go ahead, Libby. So thinking about all the things that affect our budget, some of them affect yours as well, so you're already pretty well aware of this. Our class sizes have been fairly level. They've been growing. We just closed our first round applications for next year, and we had in the first round 193 completed applications, 313 total started applications. That's more than all of our applications last year in all three rounds, and this is just the first round. So we are looking to how can we meet the needs of students and industry across our region. We're trying to maximize the space that we have um, in our current center, which is located at Spalding High School. And we're looking to develop a full day model to better support our, need, our students and also think about how we might use those spaces in multiple ways. Right now we have a program that's in there and that's it. We can't do multiple programs in there, but if we expand our day, there is a potential that we might be able to use those spaces more than once and therefore fill a program like auto where we get 60 or 70 applicants, we can only put 16 students in there with one teacher based on the state rules. And so we either need to add staff to get a few more in or maybe use it twice a day. So we're looking at those opportunities. <clears throat> we know that um, the anticipated f state funding that comes directly to us from the state, that base amount has gone up and we also know that insurance as 12.6% is, I'm sure that's what you're getting projected as well, that's what we're all getting. Our liability insurance, which is also a little different than yours, um, is going up as well, and supply costs, and as I think, yes, every, you're in a negotiations time, so are we. So we, those are sort of unpredictable what those changes will be, but they're gonna be going up. Go ahead. So we anticipate there's gonna be some sort of salary increase. We know that the health insurance is going up. We know we're gonna need two um, teachers, one for that second emergency services program because we have enough applicants to fill it. So we can't have the same instructor doing both programs. And one potentially to support the academics. We already have a literacy interventionist and a STEM coordinator that can support that work as well. There's um, basically the resources pieces for the supply budgets. <laughs> Thank you. Read it. That would be better. <laughs> ah. And most of you probably know, and maybe um, maybe don't know, funding for CTE is rather confusing, and I think I'm starting to get an understanding of it, and I probably will understand it just in time for it to change, um, because that's one of the Act 127 potentials is the changing of, of funding for CTE. But our tuition is based on six semester average. So in FY22, our six semester average was 144.19. In this current year, it's 155.45. Even though we have 205 students, we can only bill out on the tuition for the, the six semester average there. And we're predicting that next year it's gonna be an average of 160 FTEs. 
Go ahead. It did. So if you have 205 enrolled students now, this is just because you had fewer students enrolled in the past. Over the past Over the past semesters. six semesters. Correct. So enrollment is growing, yes. but what you can bill isn't matching it yet. Right, and, and it okay. probably never will. It could go either way. Sure. And what I understand is that the six semester average is meant to make it so that you can predict this for when you're budgeting right. of it's not going to be 50 kids are going this year and next year only 20 or whatever the interest might be, right. but that it's a little more level and it's gradual. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So this is a look at the, the counts that we had, the FTE counts, the head counts. I don't, this is not a six semester average FTE, this is our actuals, and so if you see an automotive, I just said that you can only have 16 and you see there's 18 there, that's because two of them were out on co-op. So they're technically counted as automotive, but they're not in the automotive program. They're out working in an industry like 802 Honda or 802 Subaru, which was where the two were last year. The other thing in the headcount, you'll notice there's some differences. For instance, Cosmetology 2, there was two more in FY22, four more this year. Those are adult students, so they are billed differently. So sometimes that comes into play as well. We can charge up to 40% of our tuition for adult students. What you see in that projected, the 223 total, we can do more than that um, with the co-ops numbers, but we don't have that prediction in there. Is Sorry. Essentially yes. Where they're not work-based learning okay. experience where they can get paid. This is this current year um, tuition rates across most of the centers, not all of them, just to see where we fall. Uh, another board asked that I come back with where we're going to fall next year. I don't know anyone else's anticipated tuition yet, so I can't provide you with that tonight. But when I do have that, I will forward that to everyone. So our next year tuition we're anticipating is 19,251, up from about 17,500, an increase of 11%. When you take away this, the money that comes directly from the state and some of the other reductions that we get, what we actually bill the district is the 8,781. So that's the an anticipated what we would be billing the district. And a reminder that sometimes you might have 38 students here and where the six semester average might tell us there's 34. For some, it's opposite. There's a few more than based on that average for the school. This is our current year budget by function. So you can just get a look at what it is. And with any school, um, a lot of the, the funds are on the personnel, qualified instructors, qualified staff. Bunch of revenue sources. Other revenues include to, uh, Perkins funding, which we get about 250000 in Perkins funding. It's, there's some required components of that every two years. With a comprehensive local needs assessment, we do have a time grant this year that's paying for one of our instructors. So there's lots of different ways that we are funded. Again, very complicated formulas. And basically, this slide had everything that's on that little postcard that hopefully all of you received. We really thank you for supporting us and, and creating this district. And then the real work for us is that Barry City and Barry Town have seen the CVCC budget as a separate budget every year and known that it was already incorporated into their Barry school budgets and all of the other sending school budgets. Now we have 16 towns who have never seen it, and it's going to look like there's a potentially $4 million budget in front of them that they have never seen before. And we need them to know that it's already built into everyone else's school budgets, that it's not an additional $4 million that they're voting for, that it's in there. It's in yours. It's in Harwood's. It's in Washington Central's. And so that's the message that we really need to make sure that people get, that it's not extra money. It's not extra taxes. It's already incorporated and planned on. So thank you for spreading that word. And the budget passes based on the entirety of the... The budget passes based on the, uh, the 18 towns voting on our budget separately. And then once that passes, regardless of what happens with our sending school budgets, you're legally obligated to pay the, uh, that amount of yeah. tuition. So we need it to pass to be able to charge tuition, or we need to 
refigure our budget and, and also figure out why it might not pass. And I think the number one reason right now is that people haven't seen it before and they don't know what it means. Do you need every single eight of those 18 towns to vote yes? No, we need a majority. We're commingling yeah. ballots, so okay. we won't know who votes yes and who votes no. God, which is intentional. We're all in this together. Yeah, yeah. certainly. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so I think I recall last year you saying that you know the center was going to possibly look at some like expansion of the facility and the building. Um, it sounds like you're having a pretty um, notable period of growth in that. So I'm just curious, you know, in, as you're sort of fielding the growth, um, it also sounds like you're exploring partnerships as a strategy to kind of like expand your campus via other campuses and things. So I'm just curious, like as a strategy, are you still looking at like a facilities expansion, or are you looking more at like these partnership models? So the board just got it going in May and hasn't had the opportunity to really talk about this a whole lot. They want to have a public forum to discuss what opportunities they would prefer. And and if there's the build a new building or whatever that might be, that's going to take some funding that we're not sure where that's going to come from. So honestly, we're watching to see what happens with Burlington um, and where does that funding come from and how does that work out and is there a way that we can work on that. Um, in the interim, we're, we're going to look at where can we expand. We know we can't expand on our current campus, but there are buildings that are empty nearby. So are there ways to make use of those and to partner with industry to, to put forth the things that students need and our industry partners are, are asking for? Thank you. Yeah. I, it was set to be on the January agenda for our board. We're going to be voting for the budget then and a bunch of other things. So I think it's going to get pushed to February to start talking about that. So the public forum will be after that at some point. Yeah. Similarly, um, I, one of the things that the last time you were here really stood out to me was that you had to turn away half of the kids who applied, largely because of space. Are you still finding that you have to? So that the cap was 223, right, not counting co-op. And co-op yeah. students have to have been in a program with us before we can put them out on co-op. And it has to relate to their program. So imagine maybe we have 245 seats at this point, uh -huh. counting co-op. We have 293 applicants first round. Just in the first round, you have two more rounds to go. So you're probably going to be turning away two thirds, yeah. not half. Okay. Yeah. The need is really there. The need and the interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's Lynn. It's Lynn um, do you have um, any data, any data on, 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 on employment, employment for students after, after they finish a program? program? Do, program? do they, they, you know, how many, you know, kids, how many get kids get jobs in the jobs field in the that they field studied in? Yeah, we, um, we're required to pull information, and the state helps a little bit with that to get where are they in six months. Getting the information beyond that is very difficult for us because mostly we have parent information. And we don't always get the information to where the kids are. And so that's something that I also had a question about when I visited the Twin Field Board last week. And we're looking at ways to partner with the state to, find, to track down our kids further out and figure out how much, how much further can we look. We would like to see three to five year data. Right now, we've tried to collect that. And we don't have enough to really tell you how well they're doing. We can tell you which kids are still locally working <laughs> in the industry, but anyone who's gone beyond our region, we've lost touch with and how to get that information. That's a really good question. And do you know what it is six months out? Like what percentage of students are placed? Uh, it's been really high across most of our programs in that six month, month range. When we get to two years out, it's not quite as high. So they're not necessarily staying in those. But it ranges from, I think the lowest amount was 50% in one of the um, programs, and the highest was 100% in one of the programs. Um, and I, I can probably send that data to Libby, and that way she can share it with you. Great, thanks a lot. Yeah. Other questions? Thank you, Jody. We really appreciate Thank you. the Thank update you. and all your great work with the newly formed district. No problem. Thank Thanks you. for sharing gel with me. Yes, <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Have a good night. Good, good night. Good night, Jody. Um, it's now on to budget presentation two. two. <clears throat> 
of what the board saw last time and Christina even has some new numbers for the board that was that came in at about uh, <laughs> 625 tonight so <laughs> she's got a couple new numbers as well but Christina take it away yeah, good right. numbers or mm. I'm sorry good numbers bad numbers just they numbers. were numbers <laughs> <laughs> I'll see the surprise <laughs> all right so outfits today <laughs> however we've been together for a large majority of the day and um, it's been interesting <laughs> so um, yes we'll start with the budget unknowns there's the glossary of terms in there still because you know it's, it's nice to refer back to those uh, the budget unknowns right now on the revenue side is the triple E grant and the transportation aid grant we will be receiving these we just don't have the dollar amounts yet on the expense side, the budget unknowns is the career center six semester average. <laughs> so that number hasn't been released to us and we're still in contract negotiations. So we're making some assumptions there. Uh, in our last meeting, Mia had um, worked to articulate a question to me and we met. Some more specifics. We, we met Looking after more, she had yeah. a chance to think about it a little bit more. Yep. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the question was around our continuous improvement plan and what what kind of budgetary or resources we've put towards the two goals that were presented and approved by the board at the beginning yep. of the year. So um, just as a recap, one of those uh, goals that's in our CIP is by June of 2024, so keep that date in mind, we will decrease our total percentage of chronically absent students from 32.3% to 20% or less. Um, this latest bout with RSV and the flu is not helping our chronic absenteeism numbers, um, particularly at UES and MSMS. However, um, Mia also asked that we put past budgetary items or past resources into this list, um, so it may be some review for the board, but also important to know. In FY22, we added Nick Connor, who's our community liaison. He works incredibly closely with our families who whose children are struggling to come to school on a daily basis, or um, students or families who are just simply struggling. Um, he, works, he works very closely with them. Uh, he's worth his weight in gold. Um, so he was at an FY22 through a grant, and then I believe the next year we um, moved him to local funds. Yes. Uh, we have five full-time social workers on staff. Currently, two of them work in our Rise, Shine, and Thrive programs through at UES, MSMS, and um, MHS, which are, are programs that are more therapeutic in nature. So two social workers, three social workers, I'm sorry. Two social workers, sorry. One share is shared between Main Street Middle School and UES, and one is just here at MHS. Um, and those have been new, newly added positions in the last year or so. Um, and then we have other, we have three full-time social workers that have been in our budget for quite some time before my, my time as superintendent. Uh, this year in the budget, it's, it's such a small budget item that we didn't mention it in our last presentation, but through Nick Connor's efforts, we have a par we're, we're suggesting a partnership with AmeriCorps. Um, and so that's, in, that's within this budget. It's approximately ten to $12,000, which is why it didn't reach the kind of presentation level for you, but it is to help this goal specifically. And what will happen is with this money given to AmeriCorps, I believe we would um, get, it sounds weird, but two AmeriCorps members, um, you know, who are usually young adults, um, will come and work closely with mm -hmm. Nick, who I can't <laughs> imagine a better mentor for young adults than Nick Connor. Um, and they will be working to mentor with students um, who are falling in this chronic absenteeism place for things other than sickness, like that we know are six. Um, they'll be working on that student to community connections, and they'll be working directly with Nick, as I said before. Um, and that's suggested for this next budget that's never been in the budget before. <laughs> Uh, we've transitioned through Nick's work to a different type of truancy model. Of course, we still have to follow state regulations around truancy and when we report that, that's mandatory. Um, but we're working really hard through Nick's effort to get in touch with families prior to those letters so that they have a relationship with the person at the school in a different sort of way. 
um, Nick phrases this as moving from a punishment, wagging your fingers, to curiosity as to what's going on, um, and so that we can help people um, bridge the gap between what's happening in their home lives and why they're not coming to school, because we know that's really important. We have day-to-day -day dashboards, so our chronic absenteeism is tracked. I had was writing a grant just today and needed to know the number, and I shot an email off to Nick. He was able to tell me in about two minutes now. So. Um, for the current state uh, in a school. So our data dashboards are really helping with that understanding. Our principals are looking at that data with their SEL teams and Nick Connor. Um, and we're reallocating just recently at the high school, we have a resignation or a retirement here at the high school in a, for an IA. Um, and we're gonna reallocate that instructional assistant position so they're more of relationship building attendance for more for the kids who like to hide in the high school. Um, so they leave class to go to the bathroom and never come back, that, that kid, um, which we do have some, and there's some hiding spaces here at MHS. So we're really allocating that position so that um, there's somebody out on the lookout and saying, hey, what's going on? And let me walk you back to class and that kind of thing. They also, we don't currently, unlike most high schools, we don't currently have somebody directly at the front door because of the way our front office is set up. So kids are in and out of our building quite a lot. And some of, the, some of them it's because of privileges and that's the way it's supposed to be for high school because they're supposed to have more privileges and that sort. And some just leave, right? So um, that person kind of would be stationed there as well. So we're reallocating some resources to get at this chronic absenteeism piece at the high school in particular. Our other goal um, by June 2024 will decrease the total number of students needing tier three supports to no more than 5% of each school's to total student population. Just a reminder that tier three supports is not special education. It is for kids who are missing universal skills. And the most layman's way to put that out to folks is uh, if you think of like <coughs> two years behind in a priority standard that we've named. So um, I was a second grade teacher, so I always use second grade examples. Um, in second grade reading, one thing that second graders work on is decoding multisyllabic words. So they wouldn't be receiving tier three services of kids struggling with that skill, but they would receive tier three services if, for instance, they don't have all their short vowel sounds because that's a kindergarten skill. Um, so we have a focus on intentional student engagement and in first instruction so that kids um, are engaged with the work and may not miss ideas. Uh, we're working intentionally with our leadership team on that this year using some strategies from Marzano Research. Uh, we do instructional rounds monthly with our leadership team and coaches where we're in each building each month as a team, go in. We, we have some common learning done by our, leader, our teacher leadership and the coaches. And we go in to see what we see in the classroom. Then we come back and talk about what kind of engagement strategies we see or don't see so that we can think about what are our teachers doing really well and what do they need some support on. And that's in a budget presentation because that's, of course, time. Time is a big time resource, especially for our instructional leaders. We've worked very hard to have a clearly defined tiers of instruction, priority standards, universal skills, proficiency indicators. That is all done through Mike Berry's work with our curriculum teams, which, of course, they get paid MOUs. Uh, through an MOU, they get paid stipends to do that work. That's additional to the job. So we have teacher leadership teams who do that work, go back to their colleagues, get feedback on the work, and then bring it back to the team for revision. Um, we're, in a, we're in a really good spot for that. Um, we've fully staffed our faculty in the, for the experts in providing remediation instruction. So we talked about this in the last meeting. We've worked hard to do that over the last five years and increased our um, interventionists, our human capacity um. there. So we're near full <laughs> staffed. I'd say that probably we have some things in this budget with literacy for MSMS would be a new position. Um, because they need another one there. I'd say we possibly will be looking more at the high school. We have one literacy interventionist and one math interventionist cur currently at the high school, which we may need, have a bigger need for eventually. And the high school has to continue to work on their system of intervention because there's some clunks in the system right now that more human resources won't help. Uh, we, need, we need to figure out the clunk clinks in the system first. Um, that is all under Mike's work. So we made a significant shift this year to move the interventionist supervision and evaluation under the director of curriculum and instruction be, um, for evaluation purposes. So Mike works with the intervention team 
all the time now. They're, they're under his office instead of under the principal's office. And what this does is a nice vertical articulation of expectation. There's no middle person who's going to mix up messages to the team, um, so it's pretty clear. Uh, we've added, of course, the Director of Social Emotional Learning and Wellness that was added last year, last year through uh, our ESSER funding. Because of the way our budget was shaking out with some of the dollar yield and things like that, I know I said I didn't want to add FTE for the second round for the board. We did actually move this position into the local budget for the budget that we're presenting to you tonight. We knew we wanted to do it. It seemed like a good time to do it, so we have moved. What the budget you'll see tonight does have the Director of Social Emotional Learning and Wellness in the local funds yeah. and out of the ESSER funds, since that, those funding, that funding source is going away. Um, We've got two full-time SEL interventionists adding an FY23-24. <laughs> They're currently in the IDEA B grant, which is a special education grant. Um, we had money in there to spend because of lack of hiring in some areas. So the carry forward from previous years, we had the money to do it this year. So it's up on school spring. So if anybody wants to be an SEL interventionist with Montpelier Roxbury, they can come do it now. <laughs> um, this will be one for UES and one for MSMS. Um, and, but we haven't been able to hire that, those positions yet. Those, would, that, those two positions would be working directly with students who have social emotional learning goals in an IEP. Um, so that's why it's in the IDEA B grant. And then in this, goal, in this budget, we've suggested um, purchasing Panorama, which is a data warehouse um, that can house a lot of pieces. Helpful? Very, yeah. thank you very much. I just have a quick question. For, um, what are like the requirements for or the certifications of an SEL interventionist? I imagine that's kind of a new <coughs> ish position. It is completely a new ish component. And I believe the requirements are that you have a knack and skill for working with kids who have that need, who know how to you know how to teach executive functioning skills, you know how to break skills down. Um, that kind of thing. And generally, I will tell you quite honestly, because this is a new need for schools in the long history of schooling, there isn't a licensure category for it. There isn't, you know, mm -hmm. so we would make it work with the licensure category that the person had and do a lot of training. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's not, it's not one that's going to have right. that licensure category. Mm -hmm. You know, we hope to find somebody who's got a lot of training, a lot of experience. Oftentimes, other schools who are doing this right now are getting people from the mental health field who may have been behavior interventionists um, with Green Mountain or something like that in the past and have a teaching license. Um, so it's, it's, that's wh where we're looking for. We just haven't found anybody yet. The um, ESSER funding for the social emotional administrator position was going to last for the next budget plus one more. Or no? Was no, it just, just, one the more? Net, just one more. So is there, what sort of happens if it's no longer being? Yeah, good question. So what uh, we've been told by the Agency of Education is because that money was, was targeted towards social emotional learning to keep that money dedicated to that bucket mm -hmm. um, or that theme. And so one of the things that we would really, we need to do, quite honestly, is build our profession, our capacity in um, collaborative problem solving with kids who are truly having a hard time learning skills, learning SEL skills. So under Jess Murray, our director of social emotional learning, she's putting together right now um, a, a um, suggested course of study through with Think Kids, which is out of um, a, a mental health hospital in, at, in Boston. Um, it's based on Ross Green's work if, you've, if you know this stuff, I'm looking at Kristen, because you probably have heard that name before. But it's about lagging skills and how do you identify the lagging skills and how do you work with kids and families to build those skills. It's a very positive approach to behavior um, rather than reactionary and disciplinarian. It's more of they have a, it's just like a kid who's struggling in reading. They have a skill they haven't learned yet and they, we need to figure out what that skill is and how to teach it. Um, and so it's through Think Kids. I may have a... Linked, linked to something. Yeah, oh, in my superintendent mm -hmm. report, yeah. So we're going to focus a lot of that money. It's not cheap. Um, and we have a large team that need to be trained. So it would be all of our social emotional learning interventionists when we hire them. 
It would be all our Rise, th Shine, and Thrive employees, including our instructional assistants. We are our assistant principals. Our principals need training in it. So it's a large group of people who would be trained. So it's a, it's a good chunk of change. And then once they're trained, can they continue to utilize those skills, or is there ongoing? There's ongoing. The, a big chunk of change in the um, suggestion that Jess is putting together is coaching through Think Kids. So there would be a person, two people who come and coach the and teams. Tuition, sort of. Yep. Yearly fees. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So it's like the training, the upfront training, um, and then there's coaching for the next couple of years. And we're trying to get them to charge us up front so we can put it in Nesser. <laughs> you know, put it all, put yearly things in Nesser. Are we, should we let Christina go on? Yeah. And then, oh, great. <laughs> all right, so the changes since the last time I met with you, um, under expenses, as Libby just mentioned, we reclassified the social emotional director to local funds from the ARP ESSER money because that is gonna sunset. Uh, we added back in the four permanent substitutes. We also added some one-time expenses to the high school, the middle school, and to the facilities. The state factors that have changed since I last met with you, um, the first draft of equalized pupils was distributed. Currently, Montpelier Roxbury decreased by 10.9. This number is likely to change, and it did about 45 minutes ago, <laughs> so that's what I'm gonna I did a draft just an hour ago anticipating changes, so we'll get to that. Um, and also um, the CLA, we have some information on the CLA that has changed. So the tax rates with this current budget, with all those changes, um, the education spending is up 6.51% and the education spending per pupil is up 7.45%. We received the first draft of equalized pupils. Um, I'll talk to, about that in a little bit. <laughs> the property dollar yield is still set. Um, they haven't changed that. Uh, that'll um, probably change by May. Uh, the CLA for Montpelier decreased by 6% and increased in Roxbury by 3.5%. So with these current assumptions, the tax rate would decrease by um, 0.12 for Montpelier, so that's less than one cent, and decrease by 10.92% for Roxbury, which is about 15 cents. The next slide shows that impact um, on the property values based on $100,000, $200,000, $300,000 property value on your tax bill. So. In Montpelier, $100,000 property value, your tax bill would decrease by $2, $4, and $6. In Roxbury, it'd be $157, $314, and $472. And the next slide, maybe I should jump into the change. Yes, yeah, so about 45 minutes ago, we got an updated equalized pupil number. And what I had ran about 15 to 20 minutes prior to that was if our equalized pupils dropped 22. Um, and what was just released is it's dropping by 18 point something. So I was pretty close in my estimate. <laughs> so with that new news, <clears throat> and again, these are just estimates. Um, so when I go and plug in the new equalized pupils, uh, the tax rate for Montpelier would increase by a penny. and for Roxbury, it would decrease by 14 cents. Um, so I just wanted to point that out, that we are getting version two of the equalized pupils, and um, that'll be in your next presentation. I believe the next presentation is the public forum. So I'll have that ready, and we may see a version three by then. The slide eight, that says ballot language. Um, this, Libby and I just wanted to bring to you this language changed a few years ago, um, and it's important to note that the current language does not clearly show the voters that our current budget that we'll be presenting is a decrease in taxes. Set aside the fact that equalized equal pupil taxes. or equal taxes, yeah, yeah so, um, so my note is not 
accurate right now, but this is the ballot language. So it, it says, shall the voters of Montpelier Roxbury Public School approve the school directors to expend 28580000 which is the amount the school directors have determined to be necessary for the ensuing fiscal year. It's estimated that this proposed budget, if approved, will result in education spending of $19,382 per equalized pupil. This projected spending per equalized pupil is 7.45% higher than the spending for this current year. So that percentage doesn't really reflect what's happening to the tax rate, okay? So it's important to really get that message out there that even though it says 7.45%, which could be a scary number, um, it's not really what's happening to your tax bill. So we wanted to put that out there. And Christina, if the if the equalized pupils stays at the new number, it's actually going to be higher than 7.452%, isn't it? Um, yes. So, it, yes. yeah, it will go up. Number. Mm -hmm. that, okay. Uh, so, well, I guess that's the end of the presentation. <laughs> questions? I'll take any questions. This is the language that it has to be. <laughs> yeah, the statute. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, it's in statute. Yeah, it's just that we have to put a real communication push out yeah. once we once the board says yes, this is the budget we want to go with, or no, tell us. Um, but we have to put a real communication push out, I think, to say, yeah, the spending per pupil is increasing, and your taxes are not. Yeah, and and just for context, I mean, we've we've been at this boat before, like where did. Yeah, and unfortunately, the you know the numbers don't make intuitive sense, and the language is not helpful. But yeah, I mean, I think putting together some fact sheets, getting some op eds out there, explaining this, um, uh, you know, using using social media as a tool to make sure that people know that when they see seven point little over 0.45, um, that is not the taxes. That is not the impact of the taxes. Okay. And I think, I think if we do some education, most people will get that. Yeah, and it's worth, you know, combined with what we heard from CVCC as well, yeah. with different language for the tech center. Yes. Like both of those things may be scary to voters, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the way it's presented if you just walk into the ballot box without any context, the way it's presented is can be incredibly misleading in terms of how it's going to impact your pocket. I can tell you, um, my professional organization, Vasco, they did a survey and asked all of us business managers how detrimental this language is to our budgets passing or failing. Um, and it was, I think, just about 80% said it's very detrimental to getting budgets you know, or getting the information out there correctly. So they are looking at, you know, possibly advocating for change in this area. And Lynn, I want to make sure you're part of the discussion, so I don't know she's if you know. Not, I, just, I think she's in Maryland. She's Maryland. She? Yeah, she's oh. Maryland, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, got it. So she's still here. Yeah, go ahead and feel free to, to pipe up or, or raise hand, but I know it's um, easy to fall off on, on Zoom. Yeah, no, I'm here and thank you. Um, yeah, I was, con you and I spoke about that a little bit. I was concerned that it might not be really clear to voters, um, especially with, um, you know, people worry about the reappraisal and what that means. And, and I understand that's not going to have a terrible impact on um, people's property taxes the way that that new um, valuation works. But that's not always clear to people. And so I think it is really important for us to get that information out there, you know, the real effect of what's happening with the school budget. Oh, I have one more question. Um, Libby, do you have a, is there some kind of printout that shows the line item change amounts? Like I know you added in staff and you maybe added in some more facility. Is there some way, um, um, and it may have been in a the changes updated, for this the, the changes for this second round. You mean, Lynn? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Christina, like, do you have they be highlighted somehow in the 
yeah. on the so, sheet so that the ones that have changed are evident when we look at it. We can see how where those the amounts of money went to what yes, categories. Sir. During the public forum, we'll do a much longer presentation of the board, and you'll be able to see where everything's been changed. And facilities put the... Oh, yes. So mm -hmm. I did write down some of the changes. So for the high school, they increased on the Fall Harvest Festival um, prom and Project Grad. They increased um, the response to intervention, RTI. Um, at MSMS, they mostly increased supplies um, for racial justice and in their innovation um, teachings. And under facilities, um, we added back in the guidance suite at Main Street Middle School. So those were the highlights of the changes. Thank you. Thank you. I just um, wanted to add a little bit of the context for why I was asking about the um, what's now slide four in um, the presentation, which is that the continuous improvement plan is what the board approved in, I think it was June, um, for this year and next. And the way that I think about it is, for as the as my, from where I sit as a board member, the, one of the big questions that I'm asking myself is, are we spending the money to meet the needs that we have? Are we spending enough money to meet the needs that we have? And um, this, the CIP is a very good example of Libby and her team looking at the, the strengths and weaknesses of the district and saying, these are the areas that we need to focus in on. And so I thought the connection of here's what here's the money that we're spending right now to address, to get make progress t toward these goals, was a good way of demonstrating for, or for me to wrap my head around and then also demonstrate for the community um, what we are spending to meet some of our biggest needs. So I want us to just add that bit of context for those who are not necessarily showing up at every single board meeting and following the play-by-play. -play. Um, and, um, and also, that was very helpful. So thanks for digging into that, Libby. The Just one clarifying question, I think, on slide four is when you say the fully staff faculty expert, that is, we did add one, one um, in interventionist. Is that is there? For any, this particular for this, budget? Yes. Yes. Yeah. One, one interventionist has been added to the local budget uh, right. literacy at Main Street Middle School. Yep. Um, we have shifted funding sources for other interventionists right. um, around a bit. Right. Great. Yeah, I just, um, <coughs> yeah, just we got a question in the chat, and I don't want to exclude members of the public, but just to follow protocol and be fair, uh, our public comment session at regular meetings is where we take comment from non-board members. Um, uh, otherwise, we don't have questions during the presentation, uh, and we are having uh, you know another budget presentation where there will be more time for for public questions. So um, I, I appreciate the interest, but um, uh, even as an employee of the district, we're we're not we're not taking questions. So thank you. Um, and you can certainly email your questions to us and to Libby, and, and, and we can answer them prior to that or if they come to the next board meeting. Um, I did have one other follow-up yeah, question yes. that wasn't related to the slide four, but um, pretty soon we're going to be looking at the policy monitoring report for the special our special education policy to see and the, that we're not in compliance and that we have an action plan. And so my question is, um, is there are there any other one-time funds? I know we don't want to put more staffing into this budget, but are there any other one-time funds that would help us with the work to be done to get into compliance? A lot of the compliance that you see it saw that we were um, dinged on by the agency of education are a lot of accountability measures, uh, dates missed, okay. um, lack of notes. Uh, they were they weren't so much training human resources needs. They were lack of accountability on the staff's part, um, or holding holding the staff accountable that we uh -huh. can talk about in the policy monitoring. 
Um, so I don't believe there's any need for any financial resources to be put there right now. There needs to be leadership and oversight put there right now. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Um, a question I know Emma had, um, and I'm, I'm guessing the answer is no. Uh, you know, there was some fund balance money put in to the general budget. Is that still all in there and in the same yes. amount? Okay. And then I think Emma, speaking from an email, um, is, is questioning whether all or any of that should be in there. Well, if, you, if the board wants to take that out, it will increase the tax rate. Um, and if you want to increase the amount of fund balance, it will decrease. Or okay. fund use from the fund balance, okay. it would decrease. Yeah, um, which, yeah, which is yeah. what I'm saying as well. Yeah, yeah that, that would, make sure that would be the board's there. prerogative on, yeah. on what they want to do there. So just to put that in, make sure I understand what you just said. In our, first, in our budget presentation two, one meeting ago, yeah. two weeks ago, the, what we saw was a planned transfer of $400,000 from the fund balance into the general fund to cover general fund costs. Yep. And Emma's asking, is that still the plan? And you're saying yes. It is. The budget you saw tonight still so that is still the plan, $400,000 okay. from, yeah. the, from the yeah. fund balance. Rather than keeping it in savings, essentially. Right. Exactly. And the okay. effect of changing that, you know, especially since we've added some things in, would be making it from right now, it looks like it's going to be essentially a flat or relatively <laughs> flat in for terms Montpelier. of for, for Montpelier, Montpelier and a tax in. decrease for Roxbury right. to an increase for Montpelier and a, a, probably a continued decrease probably, for Roxbury. Yeah, probably a smaller decrease for mm -hmm. Roxbury. And and what does that leave us in the fund balance then if you take out the four hundred thousand? I think we're still well over the two percent required. Oh yeah. We're over two million. Yeah. Okay. But I did wanna raise that on behalf of Emma. Christina's good. You got the number? <laughs> exactly what's in there. No pressure. No pressure. I'm not, not feeling any pressure. <laughs> um. <coughs> Other questions or things we'd like to see whenever we come together next, January something? You got it. Got it. <laughs> the unaudited. Oh, I'm sorry. I just said looks good. Oh. <laughs> Um, the unaudited fund balance as of 6-30-22 is 3894000 So that's before we take that 400000 out for this upcoming budget. So you just, And then you have some set-asides. So once you have take away your assigned fund balance and committed fund balance, you're down to 1593000 So you'd end up... With one million ninety three, uh, one million one hundred ninety three thousand. Right. It was a little high with my two million. No. That was definitely helpful. Those are big numbers to hold in my head. Can you remind me what our um, policy says we must have in the fund balance, please, Christina? Two percent. Yeah. Total budget. Two percent, which is around five hundred thousand. Is that right? What's our total budget? Total budget is here, so two percent oh, of that number. Two percent of that would be like five hundred and forty. Five. Three. Okay. Thousand. Yeah. That was close. So. That was impressive. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah so we're, 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 we definitely are not in policy violation territory. Um, further questions for Christine or Libby? Uh, Brett? I just have an, uh, for my information and, and uh, question, the, why does the property, how the property dollar yield comes out in May, why doesn't that have an influence, what is the, 
what it, what could be the influence? Why doesn't that have an influence on the budget that's voted on in March? I don't understand it that. Does. It does. The project. We've gotten the projection, um, and the projection could change slightly. Typically, does slightly, um, and then it comes out in May because the legislator. It has to be voted on by the legislative body, and that's when they vote on it. So it's pretty close. It's, 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 yeah. yeah, it's a very slight difference from the projection. But, sort of. Yeah, but the. I mean, even the budget that's approved in March by the voters, the, the numbers can change after that, yeah, depending on what the legislature right. does, I, which has happened in the past. I mean, the, you know, I think it was three or four years ago where we passed and yeah, it was like a 2% increase and it ended up being like a 0.5% decrease by the time the legislature finished in May or June or July or whenever they finish these days. Those are the kind of changes you like. Huh? I said, those are the kind of changes you like. <laughs> those are the it kind of changes you like. Way. But it, it can go the other way, yeah, too. Right. Um, and in the last, the last two years were slightly unprecedented in how much it's increasing. Um, prior to those two years, in my you know, 12 years of doing this, that number's changed 100 to $200 and increased, which would decrease your tax bill. So that's been the trend. It's just 100 or $200 going in your favor. But this $2,000 increase from year to year is unprecedented in the last couple of years because of the, the fund balance and the Ed Fund, so. Is that, does that explain why a 7.45% overall increase does, shows up as a 0%? That's essentially, yes, that's essentially what I need to communicate with people that, that, is, that yes. understand it close yes. to as well as I do, <laughs> maybe not quite as well. Factors outside of our control. Yeah. yeah. If we were to have a normal year, you know, from this year to, well, even FY24, this budget, to FY25, you might see that if it was a normal year, go up $200 maybe. So it wouldn't have such an impact on your um, overall tax rates. Again, it's just, it's a large dollar amount this year, so. I think we're, I think we're done. Uh, no, this is great, and uh, excited to <coughs> visit it back in January, but um, yeah. yeah, great job uh, putting this together. It's very well explained, and. Um, yeah, thank you for page four. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was very helpful. Thank you. Okay, thanks for seeing Thanks for seeing Happy holidays. Maybe I will try not to write this. Yeah, go for it. It's festive. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm surprised Sagey and Red are matching today. <laughs> I usually do. That's the same plan. So, policy monitoring. Uh, so we've got D7, F13, C28. Um, so entertain a motion to approve those, and then we can discuss them once we have a motion. Uh, do we have a motion? I'll make a motion to approve policy monitoring reports for D7 special education, F13 in district elementary school transfer policy, and C28 transgender and gender nonconforming students. Okay, do I have a second? I'll second it. Um, so discussion, and I think you answered one of my questions, I'm sure others too. It seems like, you know, obviously we don't like to see noncompliance, but it seems like most of the noncompliance are kind of management system things yes. that are being addressed through leadership. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. So we were required when the Agency of Education found, these were from the Agency of Education report from last year. Um, and they have response when you get that letter, right? Yeah. There, you must take these actions to correct mm -hmm. it. Um, and so Peggy Sue has been working on that. I asked her today that as of this moment, would we be in compliance with all of these measures? And she said, yes, we would be in compliance okay. with all these measures. But I didn't think that would be an accurate representation of this policy to monitor mm -hmm. without right. letting the board know of what right. we were um, turn cued into mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning of the year. Peggy Sue is excellent in this kind of thing. She's a veteran mm -hmm. special education director, um, and so she has been on it. 
and has recognized that there's a lot of systems and accountability that have fallen by the wayside over the last couple of years um, through COVID. So she is on it and, and states that we are in compliance as of today. Um, and I wanted to be fair in our representation of where we were. Other questions on any of these three policy monitoring reports? Um, I have a question, it's Lynn again, about the um, special ed uh, report. Yeah. Um, there were, I don't remember, seven, eight, nine different uh, items listed. It, was, that, was that one problem per item or were there many, were there several per item? of non you know, issues of non-compliance. I can't answer that for all of the, the things listed, Lynn, because I'm not sure. Um, I know that with the timeline pieces, there was um, some lack of accountability around timelines for starting evaluations, what would trigger an initial evaluation, um, and that has been fixed. But I could probably state pretty honestly that that was, that there were multiple pieces of evidence that initial evaluations weren't started in the in the timeline necessary um, or that there was a, there were a sufficient response time to initial eva evaluation requests. Peggy Sue did some training around just these areas. It was actually our classroom teachers that were having difficulty here and not recognizing their role in this process that when a parent says to them, I'd like a special education evaluation, that that's not a conversation with them, that's an immediate email to the director of special education to start that process. Um, and so we've provided some clarity to our general education teachers, because that's, that's typically where that re request goes to. Right. Um, so we, she's, she's on top of this, she's much more on special education general education, she's meeting with our principals weekly. You know, it's it's a much different scenario than it has been in the past two years in special education right now under Peggy Sue's leadership. Yeah, I can understand that with COVID how things could really become more complicated. And um, many years ago, I did actually do monitoring for the Department of Ed for special education compliance. <laughs> and wow. I can tell you that no school ever got a report that was 100% clean. You know, it's just, it's kind of an impossible task. There's so many moving parts, but I'm glad that, you know, you're on it. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Does the audit occur annually? Or is audit the right word or the review? Does AOE there's two different. There's monitoring and there's audit, right? The audit is a big one where there can be findings and and some very negative consequences. Should the monitoring is I'm monitoring your practices right now and your policies and your procedures and all of that kind of thing and and we're going to make suggestions. I'm not sure what these came through monitoring or audit, mm -hmm. um, and I'm not positive if it happens yearly. My hunch would be it hasn't because I haven't seen this type of documentation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or it hasn't in the past two and a half years anyway, yeah. which has been fluky. So <laughs> it's a hard, mm -hmm. not normal. And this would be this is the AOE, not. And the AOE would run an audit, mm -hmm. did that, which is different than the one that we've now we're yeah, hired the consultant yeah, to completely kind of, different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The the agency of education, as Lynn just said, is is like rules and compliance. Yeah. IDEA rules and Got compliance, uh -huh. um, where there are specific dates that things have to. You only have 15 days after this, and you need to have evidence that you've done what you need to do in those 15 days. Sure. You know, that kind of thing. Okay. That's what they're looking at. Mm-hmm. Other questions or comments? No. Um, all is in favor of approving the three policy bond reports, D7, F13, and C28? Uh, aye. 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 Any opposed? Great, thanks. Um, so now we have uh, second policy readings for the policy committee, uh, which is A20 through A24, plus a third reading of F2, but let's start with A20. Through A24, um, the policy committee made some changes, I think, to address concerns that came up uh, largely at the first reading, which was back in November. Um, those are those were redlined in the links. Um, 
I well, don't. The attachments? Yeah, the attachments. The attachments were, yeah, the, the attachments, I just noticed that today, the attachments did not have the red lines. All the red lines are in the ink, or in oh, the legs. you probably lose them in the PDF. <laughs> that just happens. No, they didn't, they didn't come through in the PDF. No, no, you probably yeah. lose them in the PDF. Yeah. yeah. Um, so given that, it sounds like a few people were confused, we could, um, well, we can address things at the third reading and possibly have a fourth reading if people aren't happy with it, because we don't have to approve it at the, the fourth reading. But uh, I just noticed that, but the, the changes are in, and I think we addressed most of the concerns, but I also, I'm guessing, because I just noticed it this afternoon that a lot of people probably did not go to the links and look at the, the changes, so. So if people did and have comments, otherwise we'll do a third reading with the idea that we may have a fourth reading if, if we still feel that it's needed. Oh, you're saying if we pull up the agenda, and click, click on the link and link on it. Got so it. I think what happens is when, uh -huh. when Anna converted those to PDFs, yep. all the yeah. changes were lost. Yep. But if you pull those up, you can see the changes marked. Well, I think I think I could still ask the questions that I have. Yeah, I mean, if, if you if we can ask questions in, in real time, uh -huh. great. I mean, otherwise, given that it's before the holidays and I'm sure people are, are busy doing things, I'm not sure sitting here and, and having us review them is the best use <laughs> of, of folks' time. Uh, but yeah, if you've got some, some immediate questions that you mm -hmm. can, can pull up, uh, we can definitely address those or at least have them. So at, um, the, at the last meeting, Libby um, raised the point that on a20, there's language about um, the board will meetings, regular meetings to be held at least twice per month and suggested to change that to on average twice per month um, so that we don't get ourselves Good catch. stuck. Did we and not you did not make that, that change. Okay. Um, that is a, that is I wasn't sure if, well, I mean, maybe there's a good reason you didn't make that change. <laughs> That's okay, uh, too. Yeah, there is a good reason we didn't talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, hold on. Yeah. On average. I'm going to just put a comment now. On yeah. average. Yes. There. Because no, uh, we... Sometimes in the summer. Although, do we want on average? Because that means if we take July off, we might. Yeah, need... but if you include the retreats that the board has, like there's some months that you have three. Okay. Leaving meetings uh, that make up for it. Because um, mm -hmm. we might even just put language in there that, yeah. The board meets this many times to this many times. Or right? just, yeah, the, yeah the, the, the board can, at its discretion, you yeah, know, reduce the number of meetings during the summer or something. Something for the policy committee so, to discuss. Yes. Well, okay. Good. Yeah. But definitely, thanks for noting that, Mia, and for putting a note in the in the notes. Yep. Um, My other question on A20 was um, whether or not, and I think I might have emailed you this one, whether or not it's useful to include any sort of um, expectation for board members to be prepared. Okay. I think it's added in. Oh, there actually, it is. Yeah. Thank you. Great. I think, that, I think that might have actually been the original. It was just it was just buried in a weird place. Okay, okay. great. Um, okay. Uh, Those no, are all my notes on A20. I don't want the page to be unresponsive. Uh, yeah, and then uh, also in, in A23 or A24, my computer just decided to stop working. Uh, A24 is Board Superintendent Relations. Uh, and, and again, sorry, I was in another meeting, but Libby had raised a question about, which I actually agreed with, uh, about reasonable efforts to not give directives, mm -hmm. um, which I can definitely see a board member being interpreted like, I tried not to give a directive, but and I decided, like, I had to. Uh, I, I made the effort. Um, so I think we changed that language to hopefully be a little more direct with the were, which is that they shouldn't intentionally give a directive or something that could likely be interpreted as a directive. Basically, to try to, you know, that, 
to make up for the situation that there could be a misunderstanding and um, and, and you know a, a board member who made yeah you know, an honest mistake or something that you know could have been interpreted in different ways is not out of compliance, but not to give a board member room to actually give a directive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if if a board member comes in as a parent or as part of like a you know a caregiver group and you know makes a comment at a meeting and you know the response you get is, you know, they said this, it's like do I have to do it? Um, yeah, you know, if, if, if one, that wasn't the intent of the board member, and two, it's not the type of thing where it's pretty obvious that it would be taken that way, it's not out of compliance. I think that works the way yeah. it's phrased yeah. right now. Mm -hmm. It works. Mm -hmm. And I think all the other things were relatively minor, but um, yeah, but take a look through. Uh, thanks for raising that, Mia. Um, I don't think it'll take a ton of time, and hopefully we can get it resolved at the third meeting, but if we need to go back and do a final draft uh, after that, I don't think that's a big deal. Um, there, I did have a question on 823 as well. Yes. I'm going to pull up the, I don't think that track changes would I don't think I missed a track change. We have this phrase, the board will assure that there are resources devoted to implementing the strategic plan and will receive monitoring reports on a quarterly basis to ensure effective implementation of the strategic plan. So we, the board doesn't have a strategic plan right now. Do you know what we mean when we say strategic plan? Yeah, I think that's another good point. And, and we had talked about. Where is it? I think it's under, under, implementation. under implementation. It's kind of like midway through that paragraph. It was 824, 823. 823. That may be. OK, yeah, flag that. Because I think we might have <coughs> removed a requirement in the strategic plan elsewhere. I don't think it's the intent of the policy committee to lock us into a strategic plan, not knowing quite what that is. Okay, I just add, I just yeah. added a comment Great. for you, you to be able to look at. Perfect. And that on A24, I had also asked if maybe it made sense for us to in, um, bring back in from the old version asset the the headings of asset protection and communication and support to the board yep um did you all discuss that and decide it was not necessary to have those um put a note back in i okay. would have to go look at the notes um i know that your comments are in front of us and i i just don't remember how that went but okay. um yeah just flag that again so we we know um Any other um, comments or questions? Hey. I don't think it matters, but on A23, the, the year is. The wrong uh, year? Yeah. 20202. Oh, down at the bottom. Yeah, the, the VBA VSBA version. Version. So we where is it? Definitely not live that long. It's, it's just at the off. very bottom, just in the brackets, it just says. Oh. To in the wrong one. 24, 23? 23. Uh, yeah. Let's go down the bottom. 
also in the yep. second. Yeah, we don't, we don't need to be around them. <laughs> in, the, in the second paragraph, in the second <coughs> sentence, it says the board will adopt to implement the vision which moves the district forward and its goals for student achievement. Mm, that's probably where it used to say a strategic plan. Yeah, that's missing something. Oh, yeah. Where is that again? Second paragraph, second sentence. At the end, so two. Oh, our goals. It's in here in the. You gotta see the track changes. Isn't that yeah. Cool? I can't see. I can't the track see. Yeah, so we, I, I think. Okay, so I think we took out strategic plan there and replaced it with goals. And oh, then, yeah, and then just didn't change it down there. And then just didn't change it down there. Okay, so oh, wait, let's see. Agenda round right? when these get passed on uh, to Anna and I to make for the board packet, they can't be in track changes. Like, just make the changes in the document. You could fold them or underline them or something like that so that they transfer into a PDF. Yeah. yeah. Because I can, on this document, I can't see the track changes, and it sounds like Rat can't either. Yeah. Oh, even on the Google Doc? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's and then the other piece is we've been we've been asked not to use Google Docs in this way too. So I think yeah. so I just want to make sure that it's yeah, we can use we can use Google Docs this way. In this way. Yeah, because yeah, we're in a public forum this way. Yeah. But I can't see what you're looking at. Okay. Does that yeah. make sense? Not yeah. neither can two yeah. board members. So yeah. I think instead of using the track changes, just write it directly into the document. Yeah. All right, perfect. And just for Anyone out there? Like all of all of these changes were made in live time at the yeah. volunteer meeting. So yeah, we are, yeah, we, are yeah. Not, we are not we are not noodling right. on this document. Um, I don't know why. Good bedtime reading. Uh, <laughs> um, great. Any other questions on A twenty through A twenty four? Otherwise, we have third reading of policy F two, uh, which is the non discriminatory mascots in school branding. No, thank you to the policy committee for all this work. Oh, um, oh um, it's not on the agenda. We have to put it on the next agenda. Um, Lynn has kindly agreed to step into Amanda's posts on the negotiation and equity committee, so we can formally make this appointment um, yeah. next time. Uh, I think just given that she's new, she's thinking two committee assignments to start might be better than three, which leaves an opening on the policy committee. I know, Rhett, you've expressed yeah. at, least, at least in the past, maybe yeah, before you I had mean, time to think better I of it. I see that some of those meetings are like the middle of the work day. That's yeah. really hard. Um, we might be able to move those to later in the day. I see that there's one coming up at three o'clock. I mean, I can. I do um, really, I was thinking about this yesterday, like, oh, I really want to participate and contribute, but I'm frightened that I'll, it'll be hard. Not that I don't want to do hard things, but I don't want to not be able to follow through. Yeah. Um, but, um, well, what, what yeah, I think it, about it, I think, I think, um, you no, know, I mean, the position is open. I've talked about it. I'm not going to balk now. But yeah. hopefully, when we make our plans and we yeah. find times, I'll be part of that discussion, and, and that'll make it more accessible. Okay, great. Um, yeah, and if anybody else is interested in being on the policy, we've had four in the past, but it would be, um, yeah, just given that it affects policy, it might be good to have a member of Roxbury on as well. So, um, yeah, so let's, let's uh, Formalize the who's um, when we get back in January, uh, and just kind of a Olivia can make a note to put that on the yep. on the agenda. Um, that'd be great. Um, sorry for the little detour from third reading of policy F two or new policy F two. Um, any comments or questions on that? Okay. Great, so that will move to being a consent agenda approval item next time. Mm -hmm. um, and but the 23, I couldn't see any changes, but if, as a member of the public, 24, I could see changes. I could see track changes and comments. But you couldn't on 23 and the link? Yeah, I could not Could not. Yeah. Huh, interesting. Okay. Um, We'll, we'll get a police after this, I 
Just, just so you know. Yeah. Okay. And I'll I'll let Emma know that we need to accept them. But thank you. That's helpful. Um, I'm going to go to a motion to adjourn because I think that's where we're at. And so let's move. Move. So moved. Okay. Great. Um, enjoy the holidays <laughs> and the well-deserved break, everyone. Uh, Thank you again to Libby and her team for putting together a great budget and getting us in good shape. And thank you to everyone in the district for a wonderful year so far. I know that after a couple of tough ones, I know there's a lot of challenges this year, but I think we're all happy to be in a slightly more normal place, um, at least moving there and, and building and uh, hopefully getting back to where we all want to be, which is focusing on making this the best district uh, for our kids. Um, and thank you, Lynn. A, yes, and thank you, Lynn. Yes, it's the first board meeting. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, and maybe you can make the second on adjourn since we've called you out because we have a motion. I'll second. Great. <laughs> all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great.